Hi, friends, and welcome. I am your hot mess of a host, Mary Hendricks from The Very Merry Life, your new mom friend that soon will feel like an old friend. Twice a week, every week, I want you to come and join me as we cover moments in motherhood, marriage, sex, and more. Some moments worth savoring, others worth surviving, all with a laugh, pep talk, or F-bomb every now and again. I want you to come as you are, but leave the sugar coating behind because guys, we know how sweet it already is. So what do you say? Up for picking some daisies? Okay, awesome. Hello, everyone. Hi, Zach. (laughs) Hi, Mary. Hi. Yay. I am excited. So I have Zach Watson here, and uh, this is a content creator that I would actually be very surprised if you guys weren't familiar with because I feel like you are... I mean, I think for being a parent, I think you're definitely on the FYP and the For You page on TikTok and and the Discover page, Explore page on Instagram, uh, because the conversations that you bring forward are not only needed and refreshing, but also coming from a dad. Um, it's newer to see and it's much needed because the mom creator space is is not unique, but the dad creator space is definitely one that isn't, it's not as broached. I don't know if you would agree on that. Yeah, I feel like a, I feel like the dad creator space has a lot of comedy and like kind of making fun of dynamics between the two, but I I'm trying to be like a self-aware consistent example of where I'm fucking up in my marriage and like here, learn from me. Uh yeah. so that you don't have to do it the hard way. You probably are doing it the hard way right now, but hoping that you can learn from, you know, a moment here where I screwed up where I added mental it to my partner. Yeah, awesome. Well, so before we get into it, I want you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, and then we'll we'll go sure. right on in. I have a tendency to jump ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so my name is Zach Watson. Uh I've coined myself as the recovering man child. Um the the tagline I've sort of been using recently <laughs> is uh, uh, invisible labor educator for men. Um, back in July, I started coaching. Uh, people had been asking me for the past like year and a half to like build courses, build stuff for us to learn, uh, to teach the guys in our life. Um, and it wasn't until um, I think I put out my first like freebie, like people could download and people were really interested in it. got a real, a lot of really good feedback. I was like, I do like coaching. I, I like holding people accountable to the best version of themselves. And so I kind of jumped into coaching. Um, I'm looking to turn that into full time and leave my job in the next six months. Um, I've amazing. been loving the hell out of making videos. Obviously it's a bit of an ego stroke when, you know, you have your first video that hit cracks a million or I think my mm-hmm. record now is 9.1 million, uh, on Instagram. Um, but realizing that, uh, all the things that I thought either were uniquely my problem or like were uniquely where I was being stupid in my marriage, like asking, Hey, uh, you know, can, can our kid eat that, uh, versus like cracking open Google and like looking at it or are they too hot? Like, is she allergic to like doing all the thinking, I didn't realize was such like a widespread issue until I read fair play last year. And I started talking about it and people started resonating with it. I have to read that because I have seen so many people read. I've, I've heard the logistics of it and I actually want to get it. And I know there's a game and I actually just followed a creator who shared that her and her husband did the game. And I think they, now it's literally where I think you, what is it? You stack cards and you see who many, who has sort of, you, do you have it? Yeah, I'd be happy to sort of walk you a bit more. Yeah, through it. yeah. I'm tell a, us about it. We'll we'll have to get into it. If anyone, I I know I had Paige Turner. I know you've talked uh, talked to Paige Turner. You guys are in yeah the same realm. But I had her on the podcast and we talked Man. about it. And she said the same thing. Fair play was like mind blowing. So she, yeah, totally. She just throws me alley oops all day. Just like kicks off a subject and I'm like, oh man, I can stitch the hell out of this. I, I tag like- her in so many things. I'll have to tag you too. But I tagged her recently. I actually saw you cover it. Um, the one of the dad coming in being like, you don't feel good. And what's for dinner. <laughs> yeah. But I tagged her in that and I was like, yeah, you need feedback on, uh, on this one. Cause she, she hits it on the head, but, but actually before we get into fair play, because, so I had Paige Turner on, if anyone here is listening, if you go back a few episodes, I don't remember which one it is. I'll, I'll link it in the show notes, but, um, with Paige, she had actually talked about how, or I'd seen you guys both together. You either did a video off of one another or did something. I, I stitched I her a, a good, a good amount. Yeah. But you had, I think had done one where 
I think you were talking about how men with Paige, she angers a lot of men. And I don't think she's like, for us, it's kind of like an echo chamber. Like she's talking to women who are like, yeah, yeah we know this. Yeah. But with men, oh, yeah, I, I feel like you probably. You're about to talk about. Oh, really? Kind of. It's yeah. like men don't listen to women. So you're kind of, you kind of said like men probably won't listen to women, but they're going to kind of, maybe it will mean something if it's actually coming from a fellow dude. Yeah. <laughs> well, so what I, I get the same DM very often, probably, I don't know, maybe 15 times a week or so um, yeah. is a woman coming to me. Hey, please help. Love your videos. Been following you for a while now. My husband won't watch your videos. He won't read fair play. He won't touch it. He thinks it's just a misandrous thing. Mm. How do I approach mental load? He just doesn't get it. And it makes for an appropriate DM response is me saying, look, the, the best way I think you can create mental load for him is by creating like an objective like this is what mental load is objectively rather than mm -hmm. coming to it subjectively and saying, this is all the invisible stuff that I do around the house because that turns into uh, a lot of, uh, you know, myself included back in 2020, Alyssa tried to bring something to my attention and we reflected recently that like she was too afraid to bring it up to me because she thought I would get defensive. So yeah. I'm not that far removed from being that guy that, you know, my partner was afraid to bring these things to my attention um, but I think what was can... the eye opening moment for you? So what was the moment that was like, I want to, like you said, recovering man child. So like, when was the moment being like, I don't want to be a man child anymore. So like, what was that for you? So I think I have like a disappointing answer to that one. I would say I had about 80,000 women holding me accountable to being a good guy. I was, I was just sort of sharing my experience on paternity leave was where like the first like real following came from um, mm -hmm. back in fall 2021. Um, and then Laura Danger and uh, Abby Eckel had recommended to me to read Fair Play last summer. And so part of it was like, Oh, this will probably make some good content. They're recommending this book. I didn't know too much about it. I just knew that like, yeah, there's some, I knew that there was inequity from, you know, all the comments and, you know, using my eyeballs to look at uh, my own marriage and our own situation. Um, but I think as I was reading the book and promising sort of to myself that like, I wanted to give really authentic, like in the moment reactions to things. So, like mm -hmm. I would read chapter two um, that talks about like the inequities in, in the world around motherhood. Um, and the, the moment that I would have something to talk about, I'd pause the audiobook and share like a sort of like a hot take reflection on it. Um, yeah. and so I, the aha moment kind of came as I was listening to that book and I was trying to provide value for my creators. And the reason that I feel like this is a disappointing answer is because you know, most people don't have that kind of following that are holding them accountable to being that version of themselves. So, and I'm going to answer something that I, that I think is almost part of the implied question is like, how do we get more guys to have that aha moment? Yeah. And yeah. I think it was, I now had language to describe something that I didn't fully understand. It was like this invisible, it's like, yeah, there's something there. I don't know. It's, I don't know how to describe it, but I think when we can start including mental load, invisible labor, um, emotional labor, decision fatigue, when we can start using those words out loud as like a normal part of our lexicon at home, like that's, that is what I think would have made the difference for me a couple of years earlier is if, yeah. um, she had even just said like, Oh wow. Like you do a lot of emotional labor for your students, Zach. And when they start and coming back to like what we were saying earlier of like how to present it to guys in a, so that they're not defensive. So if you can point out to them where they are doing emotional labor, where they're putting on the mental load for their bosses and stuff, or if they're a manager, they, they probably would really understand mental load in spoken in their own language. Um, I think that's a really good Trojan horse sort of for using that word and be like, Oh, well, now that you can see mental load that you bear at work, this is where I bear it at home. And I think it's a lot yeah. easier for them to understand as an objective thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's hard. It's a big conversation. I I mean, I even deal deal with it. And my husband's pretty receptive to it, but we also have like a weird dynamic where he's a police officer and he works a ton. So it's just like the way it's set up where he I think for me our especially when we had three, like we have three kids and I think when we had our third, it definitely rocked us a little bit because that mental load capacity really increased mm. tenfold. And I just didn't think he, I wasn't, it wasn't recognized. And for me, I was like, all I need like is just the ability for you to recognize it because it is incredibly stressful and it stresses out parents way more and especially moms, but it, it depends really as to who, but majority of the time, statistically, it is moms that are carrying the majority of it. But like, it's in things like, you know, mental load is we just went to London last week, my husband and I, guess who wrote the lists, like, and knew all of the things and made sure I put, I had to buy a scale so I could put my kids on a scale to make sure I weight them to know how many their dosages in case, God forbid, they had an allergic reaction. Like I had to do all of these things that my husband at the time, like, I think he, and he, again, my husband's so great, but when you, it, it's pointing it out. And I think I've gotten better with like pointing out certain things where I'm like the other day he walks in, he's like, do we not have apple juice out? And I'm like, do you have eyes? Like, why are you asking me mm. right now? Do you see apple juice out? No. Okay. Well then it's in the fridge, honey. Like go there, please. But I think he just didn't realize it. And we've gotten better at having the communication. And because of that, it's actually been so relieving because like he'll do things like we're like he now cooks dinner a little bit more often, which I'm like score. But all of those things are just like, it's hard. It's a weird dynamic too. My mother-in-law didn't set him up very well also, which I think is like the hard part because I don't want to teach him stuff and that's exhausting, yeah. but also I have to. And that's like a thing that I know I have to take on a little bit to be like, okay, you, he never learned how to cook. He doesn't know anything. He thought grilled cheese was made in a microwave for Christ's sake. So I'm like, okay, man, <laughs> we have to teach you a little bit. The, the, this, what you said there of like, you know, these are things that you have to take on. I, I think it's so many women from what I've seen in the comments are like, feel so burned out about trying to teach guys these things. Mm -hmm. And the, the really hard thing that I think I, I don't say in short form content because I'm not trying to get grilled by my audience, um, which is yeah. 92% women is saying like, look, if, if you want, if things are the way that they are and they probably, uh, a lot of places they suck. Like if you want to keep going, you're already doing emotional labor. And I would invite you to consider that like, if you adjust how you're going about your emotional labor, there's a good chance, like, there are other good things that can happen. Um, yeah. so like I know watching, watching your tone or like, like doing that, like management of your, your tone is like, I, I had to learn that as a teacher. Like, yeah. I, I think that's part of the inside lane that I've had and like explaining these things is we did do a ton of this as teachers and working with special ed kids that would flip a desk and throw a water bottle at you. If, uh, yeah. if, if you told them that they had homework the wrong way. Um, yeah. so I, I, there's a ton of emotional labor that women are doing. And I think there's probably a lot of ways that are not the most ideal that we're going about it. And, um, I'm hoping that I can shed light on that as I go along, but then again, I'm it's hard yeah, because it is, it's really like, I think the big thing for me and what I got stuck in was that I, I don't know what it is. I think, well, one thing I always remind people is like, no one's a mind reader. So mm -hmm. if you need help with something and I don't like to call it help, but event it, at beginning it is help because if that's what you want to view it as and like, I know a lot of people are like, let's get rid of the word help, like helping things like that. I agree. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, that is what you're asking them to do until eventually it becomes yeah. normalized where then it's just regular. But at the beginning it is help because that's not their norm. And if we want that to disappear, then that's, you know, the conversation has to start. But I remember thinking like, he should just know, he should just know that this is what it is. And then I realized like, well, he doesn't. So I have to get better. And it definitely, like you said, the tone of how approaching it, because we, I think women are very burnt out where, you know, like him asking for where the apple juice is. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like, are you kidding? But, and, and it takes everything out of me to not like get pissed like you do get pissed and i think yeah. the burnout is there and it's i think for me it's really reframing of like how certain actions 
make me feel. And I, I feel statements are like huge for me being like, I feel like when you do this, this is how I feel <laughs> type of thing. And that's actually been incredibly helpful for us, really? but it is. Yeah. It's not easy. Oh my God. It's not easy. What have been some like ways that you've gone about talking with him, maybe a little bit differently that have helped him adjust the way that he communicates or the way that he understands things? I think the biggest thing, like for us recently, I think the biggest one that really sat on my shoulders. And again, like this, there's so many layers to it. And I think that was like the, the him, like cooking dinner and being more able and things like that. I had a moment of being frustrated because I was so busy. Like I'm trying to run a full business of doing this and, and everything, but yet I'm still considered a stay at home mom. So it's still very hard, especially when you're home, like it doesn't matter. But I, uh, I was frustrated because I was so busy and I didn't get out to the grocery store. And I remember he got home and he was like, it's fine. I'll just go out and get the kids happy meals. And I'm like, I don't, or was it that, or it was either that, or I wasn't feeling good. It was one of those, like kind of like that video we recently saw, like, Hey, what's for dinner? Yeah. And the correct answer I, is not take out. It's figure out dinner. It's yeah. Take, and stop. I remember saying, and I looked at my husband and I was like, that literally stresses me out. And I said, I understand that you want to do that. But I said, and I get it. And again, like I have to look at his background and I do have to give him a little bit of forgiveness there because again, he did grow up in an environment that I, he was always getting takeout. Like, I don't think his mom was cooking ever. Hmm. Um, they didn't even have Christmas at his house. Like they just, it, Hmm. was a background that was a little bit interesting. Um, but because of that, I do have to give him a little bit of grace with that stuff. But I did tell him, I was like, I meal plan everything. And I said, so if I'm sick and I don't have a chance to do that, or I can't get up and cook, like I need to know that you can get up and, and cook them something and be able to step in without having to go oh. get them fast yeah. food and, you know, and, and it boils so far. And I think what people don't understand, and like, I've talked to moms about this is like, and it came to the forefront and this is so dark, but I traveled for the first time in the beginning of this month and I have a fear of flying, a terrible fear of flying. So in, the entire time is impending doom thinking I'm just going to die. <laughs> and what's awful about that. And what I literally said was, what scares me the most and moms have a fear of dying. I think most people get a fear of dying when they become parents, mm. but moms specifically. And a lot of the moms that I've talked to about it is because they are afraid of what that would look like for their kids. If the dads were by themselves and didn't have them. And it's, it's, that's how big the mental load is, is that we now are impacted. The fear of death is tenfold because we look at being like, well, if we go down, what is that going to look like? I don't want my kids. And I said that to my hat. I literally wrote a list. <laughs> I wrote a note for my husband before I left for this flight. And again, I'm thinking I'm going down. So I wrote this morbid note and I was like, hey, if I am go down, like this is what I need to know that you need to brush their hair every single morning. They need to have their teeth brushed twice a day. Like I went through and I was like, and no, they cannot eat just fast food. You need to learn how to cook. Like you need to know how to do these things. And that's the stuff that sits on my shoulders. And I had a really big heart to heart with my husband afterwards because I was like, I don't want that worry. Like, I know that you'll be able to handle it. Like, I I know he will be able to figure it out, but I don't want it to be a mess. And again, that's talking so morbidly, like something's going to happen to me, but you never know. So, no. <laughs> but I think that's the part of the mental load that people don't think about is like, that's what's weighing on us. It's, it's an extra what if that yeah. we don't need. Yeah. I feel like, I've, you know, it's since having our daughter, like I'm much more afraid of like, even playing basketball because I'm afraid I'm going to injure myself and then like mm -hmm. I'll be useless for weeks. And and yeah. I know like, I know Alyssa is totally capable of doing those things, but at the same time, like I don't want to burden her with that. Um, yeah. And I, I think as we've grown more equity in our relationship, I think that's become more of a concern and recognizing like, it's like she had, um, she had her gallbladder taken out at the beginning of October. So I was like, okay, I need to plan pretty much. I'm going to miss all my work calls. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to call out um, and I'm going to be on like full, full like caretaker mode for at least the next like two weeks or so. Um, and I, I think that's like a, I don't know if that's a conversation all the guys out there are having uh, when they yeah. have partners because they are so accustomed, like, oh, they'll figure it out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mental. It's heavy. hard. 
It is heavy. It's like a dark little morbid part, but it's interesting when you hear like, I remember, what did you message me that one time when we first started having conversation, you would ask me something and I have to look back through our messages. I was asking was you, something. you were, you were saying that one of the, I don't remember what the initial question was, but I'm wondering if you're referencing this was uh, the creator that had like called out other moms about like, why are we following, why are we following like re- relatable hot mess moms when mm-hmm. we should be following women that are showing like how to deliver in it. That that might've been another subject that you're not referencing. Yeah. I know. I, I know I approached that one recently cause I just I, touched on it where some creator was like, let's stop with hot mess motherhood or like, let's stop normalizing it. Yeah. yeah. It's not cute or it's not like. I actually made, I, oh. I referenced you and Libby Ward and uh, Emily Jarrett. Um, yeah. I made a video and then the audio didn't come out. And I was like, oh, darn. Yeah. Is this, is this universe telling me to just stick with my normal, like, shtick nah. sort of? Um, nah. So Go I'm going to have it. to make that one again. But yeah, I was, I was like, I wasn't going to say anything. I was like, I'm going to stay in my lane. And then she made a video about how uh, she's gaining a thousand followers a, a day or a week. And I was like, all right, now you're bragging about how you're growing and you're peddling this like 20, 20, 14 like perfectionist mom like this is how it should be and- well the, because my my thing with that and i was like you know i'm you know for me i'm busy as all hell and i think i even had a conversation the other day i'm working with someone um who got a little f- she's working with me to help with some health things that's going on and so i'm i was working with her and she got a little frustrated with me because like what every time i meet with her it's usually when my little one hasn't gone down for a nap and so i'm she's 21 months old and i i literally came home from this trip that my husband was on we were both on and she had a black eye <laughs> she had a black eye cuz she's psychotic she's just a crazy toddler so she's everywhere so any time we've had a meeting and she's awake it's just like it's like me popping into the screen and like coming out and grabbing her and um the second time that we had a meeting i was doing my makeup and she got a little frustrated with me because she was like you're always doing something and i just want to know that you're focusing per se and i was like trust me i am focusing this is just how i function and then the conversation got a little bit more into like you need to take better care of yourself and i get it like i try but i also like think from a mom perspective of being like motherhood, I think is harder than it ever has been right now because of there's so many factors. Like I think their economy and, and, you know, for me, I can't hire childcare right now. I can't afford it. Mm-hmm. Um, and groceries are another stress. Like there's just so many stressors on a mom's back. And then we have all the narratives of we're doing something wrong. And then you see this of moms, you know, someone, this lady saying that hot mess motherhood is, shouldn't be normalized. And I'm like, okay, well then there's so many layers to this conversation that if you really want to fix this, go down to Congress and go tell them that we need maternity leave. Like go, go fight for all of those big things that are like literally impacting moms right now, because that's why it's messy. We don't want Mm. it to be messy, but it is, (laughs) it's just how it is. Um, and like conversations like that you bring are so important for that reason, because I think, Again, a big reason why it is messy is because we don't have a ton of help. And I don't think the help that we are not help, but like, you know, the equity and everything. But I, I also don't think moms are given the due diligence for all the shit that we are actually doing. Instead, we're blasted for it. We're told, we're told that we're, you know, we can't be messy, even though we're doing so much. You know, there's a, there's a video that actually had an impact on me and I like did something a little bit different last night because of it. I'm, I'm sure you've seen the, um, you are such a good dad that the lady, um, Fer- Farida, um, she, she made like these two songs. You are such I'm a sure good I've dad. Seen it. Yeah. And I, I got tagged in it a bunch of times and sent my way. Um, and then she made the make a list. And she, she has like a small album called the mother load. She was on like good morning America or something for yeah. it, talking about mom problems. Um, Either way, there was this moment, like, it's pretty much talking, not even really talking shit about dads, but talking shit about the culture that rewards dads for doing the bare minimum, saying you're such a good dad for existing more so than like doing the laundry and helping out with like the the gentle parenting and stuff. And so last night, our toddler, I actually came close to um, canceling again today because our toddler puked last night, but um, then things worked out for me to be here. (laughs) Um, so it's midnight 
uh, you know, Alyssa had been having a hard time falling asleep. So we usually just switch off with whoever's doing stuff at night. She gets up, she comes in, Hey, where did you put the thermometer? And I'm thinking okay, thermometer, yeah. why would you need the thermometer? And where did I put the thermometer? And I'm realizing she's taking her temperature. That's probably mean she's having a fever. Did she, did she puke? Yeah, yeah, she puked. Where the hell is the thermometer? Where'd you put it? And I yeah. go in there. I'm like, okay, all right, back to being awake. Cool. Um, and then just kind of help. She ends up sort of taking care of Everly. And then I work on like managing the puke and the, the cleanup so that she can go back yeah. down. As we go back down to sleep, there's this moment where she says, oh, you didn't, you didn't have to do that. So like one time, I think she was experiencing some mom rage where there's puke everywhere. This was like a couple months ago. And uh, I I did mess up. I went to just put it straight in the washer without getting like the chunks out. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, and so then the second time I like, all right, I'll get rid of the chunks, got them in the sink and like didn't think to like sanitize the sink afterwards. Yeah. Um, so she like, she flipped out on me that time. And so like last night I was like, I'm not making any of those mistakes. I'm washing it out. <laughs> I'm getting the chunks out first. Then I'm throwing the chunks out and then I'm sanitizing the sink and then starting the wash. Um, so probably, uh, probably didn't take me that long, but I got back to bed. She's like, Oh, you didn't have to. I was like, I didn't, I didn't share with her in that moment. I was like, I'm not, I'm not failing again on this one. Um, but I just said, you know, I just wanted to get it taken care of so I could not think about it anymore. Uh, or yeah. get off my mental load. Well, you and- know what's interesting about that story? Because I guarantee if you shared that story, like there is such a tie. I- I'm sure you get it. There's probably people with masculinity is like a big thing. Because I can only imagine the comments that would come in on a story like that. Of like of I can imagine men excusing a ton of that. Hmm. where Or even just like dissing the masculinity portion. Like I've seen men argue that all the time about like – something about like he's a man's man or he's not a man's man. It's like the biggest diss to any of that. And I'm like, well, I don't think people understand. Like, you know, it's something like that. And like, you know, no one wants anyone to feel like a failure, but in like a portion like that, you think about the mental load of like you put it in, you didn't know the empty out all the chunks of all vomit. And then you have to rewash the laundry again. And not only that, you have to take out all the laundry, shake it all out, make sure all the chunks are out and then put it right back in and then not sanitize it. Like, it's like little things like that where some people look and be like, well, I don't understand why that's a big deal. And we're like, well, that's, it's like, it's tiny things, but it's, they yeah, sound. Multiply that times 90 a week or a month. Like that's a yeah. lot. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why like, you know, I think there's, I don't know why there's such a pushback on like the mental load. I know Paige gets it a ton when she shares and um, I, for some reason her, her, videos are always coming up for me and they're always like the negative ones that she's responding to. But like, I see it, but again, it's the men in her, in her comment section that just go bonkers. Yeah. Over I gotta, it. I gotta go comb through her comment section more. Cause I, there's probably a lot I can speak to. Cause I don't get any of those angry yeah, men on mine. I, and I, I need some of that. I, okay, I yeah. can use a handful more men. You hear that men? Go, go, <laughs> go on over. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's it's she's bonkers. But again, I think it's because she's a woman. I think it's uh there's a there's a little bit of like a how dare she type of yeah. mentality with that. It's it's freakish on on social media with like the whole masculinity complex. But it's a I, I don't know men, men complain. I think the running joke with like relatability stuff with like relatable marriage humor is that it's always the wife nagging. It's always like you know I you always hear just wait. Just wait until you're 20 years in and see how happy you are. And it's like always the, you know, the running narrative with marriage. And I'm like, why are we comfortable with that? Why do we want that? Mm. Like, maybe there's a reason. And that's why, like, I think relatable content is important and necessary because I think it's it screams volumes as to the reality of situations. And I think, if anything, we need to pay attention to it. That's why I don't I think relatable content is incredibly necessary um, as long as it's constructive. But I think that's why it's one of those conversations where people have to look and be like, yeah, this, there's something going on here. We need to pay attention a little bit and figure out what's – why is marriage feeling impossible after 20 years? Why are wives having to nag? Because we don't want that. Like no one wants that. So yeah. it, It's interesting. So I'm thinking about right, relatable content and comedy. So there's that Matt Reif thing that happened the other day where he uh, – Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, we don't even need to say that, but – 
Uh, do you yeah, know no, Matt Professor Ryan, he, Neil? He's on all over my FYP, but I cannot stand that man. Although, you- although we should probably, ex- I don't know if anyone here listening is understanding, but Matt Reif is a comedian. He's been in the game for like 12 years. I know all about him. I've been going in deep dive oh, really? with Matt Reif. He started off as like an awkward little man child. And now he apparently had plastic surgery, although he denies it. And he's now v- attractive. I'm saying quotations because see it but sorry i'm not trying to be a bitch um and she he now says that he doesn't like the female gaze and he doesn't want his audience to be women and he opened up his did you see that he hates he doesn't like his women audience that's he doesn't dumb want to pro- yeah. who wouldn't he's, want a woman oh, audience if you're a man that doesn't make oh sense he's to me. all angry about it he, i'm telling you go deep dive you'll learn all about it i just I don't, totally i don't need them to um, take up my energy but i'll take your word for it <laughs> but he d- opened up on his netflix special with something about domestic abuse i saying something about like getting beaten for not cooking or something i didn't i didn't watch it yeah but, but yeah. so what i was gonna say was um speaking to like the like the relatable comedy so i learned a lot from do you know professor neil on instagram no, uh, he, although I he, probably do. You, I, you've I probably see so seen him before. Accounts. He looks like James Vanderbeek um, in his like I'll profile picture. Either way, um, he makes a lot of content re- responding to slash like co- doing commentary on a lot of those like red pill like like uh, toxic masculinity podcast yeah. guys. And um, he was talking about what's a better way to go about like it's good that we do humor, but he was saying when it, when you're talking about like toxic systems and like domestic violence, you punch up. And so what Matt Reif did was he punched down. So like the, yeah. there's like the oppressor, then there's the oppressed and he punched that way. But instead, yeah. like, how do we go about punching in the reverse way? How do we like make fun of the system that creates this? I've been trying to figure out for the past three days, like how can I make a response video that punches up? at yeah. domestic violence. I haven't figured it out yet. Like I'm I'm sure there's a better way he could have leveraged his his female audience to make a really wonderful statement like pushing back against it and being funny. Um but he chose to go the other direction. Yeah. Oh, I'm wondering what a punch up from that would be. I'm going to be sitting on that all day. You're you're going to be the first person I tell about it when I figure it out. I'll I'll probably tag yeah. you in if I come up with one. Yeah, please do because I'm actually trying to think because the punch down was him saying something about it's it's the oppress the person that's the oppressed is the wrong one in this situation. So the joke was, or yeah. the the scenario was, they're in Baltimore. Uh, they went to a diner. There it was generally supposed to be like a a hate on Baltimore, I guess. Mm-hmm. And he was saying he went to a restaurant and like the first waitress they saw had a black eye, and his friend said, "Oh, I you know I feel bad for her." And he's like. They it's like maybe they should put her like in the kitchen so like we can't see her or something. And he's like, "Oh well, if she knew if she knew how to cook, maybe she wouldn't have the black eye. Like, why would they put her in the kitchen?" Oh, God, yeah. Um. So the it's interesting too is like we could also take another dimension of that joke is like putting her in the kitchen is the idea that the patron of the restaurant, um are expected to have a positive experience. And so seeing something unpleasant, like clearly someone got hurt um, is emotional labor for the patron rather than seeing the, rather than seeing the person that has the black eye, like have rather than having empathy for them, we're going to have empathy yeah. for the patrons that are, that are like paying customers, um, yeah. which is like a, in, I, I would not have understood that until um, Rose Hackman's book a couple months ago, emotional yeah. labor. Yeah, You're still stewing on how to punch up, aren't you? I know. I'm like thinking about it. I'm like right now thinking about that. That's going to be hard. If I think of something, I'll send it to you. Cause so that's I guess the, really... the punch up would be, well, what's the, what is like the structure that exists in place, the governmental or the, like the laws that exist that allow domestic violence to maybe not thrive, but like that, that don't stop it. I guess yeah. you could say like, um, was it the, the no fault clause or something is like a Texas law, I think, where it's like if if there was no domestic violence, if there was no cheating, like then they're trying to get rid of women's ability to get a divorce. What? Um, I, I don't oh, think they're God. accomplishing it, but I know it's like a Republican thing that's, that that they're working on. But no it way, could man. be like a system like like 
uh, I think it was not until I made a video about this a couple months ago in 1992, I want to say it was when I was two years old. Um, it finally became illegal for men to rape their wives. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause so, for, uh, yeah, for sex and marriage wasn't a thing. It wasn't even, I remember a law and order episode about that. So like but, that might be like yeah. a, a way to punch up as like talking, talking about the law creators that kept that in effect until 1992. And we're still probably seeing a ton of like after effects of that still existing where a lot of men are seeing their wives as property and the fact that that was not a law, that that was still legal, that like, oh, well, we had sex. What do you mean that's rape? Like she has no um, no, autonomy within our relationship for that. I imagine if you were trying to punch up on that joke, that could be some of the direction that you go to. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have to stew on that one. Yeah. Cause I like that direction. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. This guy that I, yeah, we won't deep dive on Matt Rife, but I, I already did. So if you're bored, then go ahead. Cause this guy is simultaneously destroying his career <laughs> when it just it. like, I think he's like f- going up and all of a sudden he just like, <laughs> just tanked that sucker. But it's interesting. Oh gosh. I feel like we could talk forever on the subject. It's hard. I feel like it's it's such a rabbit hole of so many layers to peel back. But like what would your first like you say, I mean, you said it, even you get DMs being like, where where does anyone even start? What would you say the first starting place for someone if they're listening right now and being like, I don't even know where to begin? Because it, it is. It's such a it's such a conversation. And it's like not a, even just a one off conversation. This isn't something that you just sit down at a dinner table for 30 minutes and be like, hey, this is what's going on. It's like a we're talking like a, a, a cis hetero uh, yeah. like woman heteronormative to, yeah, relationship. Yeah. Husband. I would probably say if you can start out in a like a calm place, like when I know a lot of people say like, Oh, like I don't want to bring up something crappy now when everything's good. Um, like I don't want to ruin it. Just give yourself permission to fail and ruin one of those moments. But I would say if you can come at it in a vulnerable place, like, Hey, so I've been recognizing where I've had a hard time communicating about this. Um, you know, we'll just take the dishes, like they, you know, I would love to talk with you a little bit more about how we can manage the dishes. I've been having a hard time talking about it. Um, in the fair play book, they talk about, um, sort of how to go about a conversation. I want to have an open, um, you know, pleasant, like productive, loving conversation with you about how we can better own this so that I'm not nagging you and you're not feeling attacked and the job is getting done and we're, we have better standards and like boundaries to communicate with. Would you be open to that? And I think having like this open kind, like all branch of an invitation. And so then you're, you're going to sit down over ice cream or a beer. I I recommend something with a little bit of a dopamine hit to it. Um, so that like they want to show up sort of, um, and say, Hey, so this is, I think that's where you start is having an open invitation to have a conversation rather than bringing it up in the moment. Hey, I want to talk about dishes right now. Yeah. Not, not the most effective. I think myself included, I can, I can get defensive in moments like that, but one of the things I referenced, so I'm a, I'm a account executive for a software company. So I have like yeah. 300 accounts. Sometimes I know their prices will go up and I'll get a call saying like, Hey, uh, like we need to talk about this. Our price just went up. Um, go away. Um, <laughs> and I'll get like a phone call and I won't answer it. Cause I don't, I'm not ready to be on the defensive and I'll say, Hey, sorry, yeah. Mr. I could have answered the call, but I'll say, Hey, sorry, Mr. your call. Um, please put time on my calendar. We can talk this over. And so yeah. it gives me an opportunity to like emotionally get ready for that conversation. Um, and have like one or two talking points ready to go. Um, which I think those are, when I ask most of the people that come to me uh, that are interested in some of my programs, like I'll say, how often are you having conversations that are planned out or like we call them the boring meetings. Um, And they're like, Oh, never. It's always like, it just comes up whenever, you know, the last straw that breaks the camel's back is when it happens. And so having those ahead of time, I think is the best 
best way. And so starting the conversation of, Hey, I want to have, I want to iteratively make changes. We don't have to build Rome in this meeting, but like, let's yeah. make one incremental change. Yeah. Yeah. Again. And I think that's why it's like, cause I, I, like I was saying earlier, I think, you know, you see so much content about like there, let's eliminate the word help and things like that. And I agree, but it has to start off with that. And I think a lot of people are like, I think because of that, they're like, oh, they should just know it's not going to happen. You have to have that like yeah. active conversation because unfortunately, I think it's going to get easier and easier and easier for people to recognize the the load that everyone else is individually bearing. Um but only if it gets pointed out the very first time and it just gets easier and easier to understand. And I think the thing, same thing too. And what I've always preached is like, I, I don't even look for necessarily a hundred percent equity in everything. I would like to get there at some point. Um, but I don't necessarily even you don't look, look for, for that because, equality, but you're probably looking for equity, right? Yeah. 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 Cause I, I think there's just equity and, and fairness in, what we're doing. So yes, equality versus equity, but, um, it's, it, I think that's the thing that everyone's harped on is that yeah. the equality factor, and it's not always going to be like that. It's just yeah. different like, seasons of life are just going to float different. Yeah. And like a simple one. So like we got goats back in, uh, April and, nice. um, we, we, in October, we got a ton of hay, uh, in our, in our shed that needs to be moved up to the barn incrementally. And so like I'm 6'5", 215 pounds, like it's a little bit easier for me to move hay. If we're talking about equality, mm -hmm. it would be expected of both of us to move those bays of hail. But yeah. when we're talking about equity, it makes a lot more sense for me to work on bringing those up rather than my 5'7", you know, 100, 150 pound wife um, trying to do that. And I also have yeah. bigger hands. Like I can probably manage like one or two of them at the same time. Um yeah. And then there are other things that, um, you know, I could get myself into trouble. Careful. What well, I there's probably here. things that she does better. I mean, you think yeah. about it, like I brought, like for me, I breastfed all of my kids. Yeah. So for me, I handled all of the nighttime feedings. Like I just did. It was just one of those things, but then it was, you know, for me, it was, my husband was then getting up and doing the outside yard work and Christmas lights or getting up early with the kids. Like he yeah. just did other things that like. You know, I, I had a guest on a while back and I had asked her about it and she says, my husband and I come in together at a hundred, hundred. There are things that he has to his strengths and he has his strengths. I have my strengths. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just the way it goes, but we both recognize that we are going to bring a hundred to the table in terms of ourselves and our strengths, even if they don't match because they're not going to ever. Mm -hmm. So I think that was like an important conversation. Like that was an eye opener because I think we get that very confused about, you know, everything Equity has to be done. Equality, yeah. yeah. It's like a tit for tat type of thing. And that's, that is one thing that has to kind of go away. Cause I think that's the, where a lot of, the only thing that's started. like tit for tat in, in fair play. And it's that tit for tat's not the right word, but um, they do recommend like measuring time is for unicorn space. Are you familiar yeah. with that phrase? No. <laughs> um, so unicorn space is defined in the fair play book. And then she wrote like a follow-up book called find your unicorn space is yeah. pretty much like a hobby doesn't really cover it, but it's something that like you're passionate about that, you know, brings you to life. It's, it's the thing when you're at like a, a birthday party where it's a bunch of adults, like what do you talk about when it's not your work and it's not sports and it's not the kids? What's the thing yeah. you talk about it is probably yeah. your unicorn space. And so they're saying like, if he's getting, you know, six hours on Saturday to do his long runs for the marathon he's training for, what's the six hours that you get to do on Sunday and yeah. keeping that they recommend to be pretty equal, equal. and having yeah. time to do that. I love that. Well, that I think is important because it is, it's huge. I think for both partners, that's even huge. Cause I know my husband even had a moment we actually talked about it when we were just in London. Cause I don't think he even recognized, but guys fall into it where he had like a hard year at work and he just, I remember one moment he just had a second and he just said, if I don't have work, I have nothing. And I will remember that, remind him of that every single time. And I did. And I don't think he recognized that it like impacted me the way it did. I was like, dude, like you got so much more going for you than anything in the world. But I think it's so important because we just, that unicorn space that you're saying is just like it, if, if it probably wasn't even there, but I think it's just important to even remind yourself that it should be there. And I think for both us, like for women, obviously we need something, but for men too, I think we get so stuck in our, 
roles of everything and that we identify that we kind of like get lost in it a little bit, yeah. which is what nuts. I'm going to have to read all this. Now I'm going to get off of it. Got to get off of here and order fair play. I've been hearing so much about it. I just have never, you would think I have by this point, I think, cause I've been hearing so much about it that I have not felt the need to get it, but now I want to, I want to get the game <laughs> like you were just yeah. saying. Yeah. And I would say careful. So it's not a game necessarily, but it's a deck of cards. It breaks up um, pretty like a, average appropriate like household responsibilities into 100 cards um yeah. and one recommendation i'll do so i brought this some of fair play facilitator um the company like trained me is there's there's about 130 of us and there's like 10 guys oh um, shit okay cool so one of the things that i recommend and i brought it up to one of their office hours and a lot of them liked this way so in in the book they recommend like sit down for like a long ass period of time and like divvy up all the cards and talk about like what all the minimum standards of care, what the dishes look like when they're done. Uh, Does it include the sink getting wiped out and the junk in the little net tossed in the trash? And um, does it include the, the counters getting wiped? So like that's the minimum standard of care. So there, a lot of the recommendations in the book are like do a deep dive, do all those things, try to cut out as many cards as you can that aren't relevant to your life. But, the way that Alyssa and I did it, which was like a, a lower level, like initial cost up front, was yeah. I now call it the 51% um, activity. So you break out the cards, identify what's appropriate for you. We ended up with 64 of the 100. And then we said, okay, who owns 51% of any of these tasks? And yeah. handed it to the person that owned about 51%. And there were definitely a couple, like I was really proud that had landed in my hand. Like I think nighttime wakings, like once she was not being breastfed and yeah. um, uh, we were on formula and stuff, I owned 51% of and then from there, because most of the time the woman typically have more of the mental load yeah. is okay. What's something Zach's doing 80% of that he can do a hundred percent of. Yeah. And let's take the last 20% off of Alyssa's plate and put it onto his. Um, and so in your first time going through it, I think we gave ourselves three or four hours the first time. Yeah. Um, she still hasn't read the book. I'm just like kind of championing it in our house. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is we we delegated two of them to me. So when we first split them up, there were 64 cards. She had 44. I had about 20. And we said, okay, what are two? We know that the load is much more on her. What are two that we can talk about tonight that, yeah we create like minimum standard of care for, and I will take on the rest of it that I'm already taking on a good amount of. Um, yeah. I think that's the best way to go about implementing I love that. Okay. I'm sure there are other ways, but that's the best way that I've found. All right. Yeah. I'm going to try this. I'll update when I, when I finally do, I'll, I'll link everything too in the show notes for anyone listening. If you guys want to check this out, cause I, I need to try it. I'd be just curious. I think it'd just be eye opening for so many. I know it'd be eye-opening for my husband. He's, again, my husband's a great guy. He's totally receptive. Again, he's like, unfortunately, like I said, my husband just like, he wasn't modeled this. I feel like that's a big, I think this is a generational thing. Like it was Mm -hmm. even, I know my, like my, I know my mom even used to say that like my grandpa has never, my grandfather never changed a single diaper in his life. Like it was just a generational thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of those that we just, you know, for me, I, I always, you know, I grew up with a dad that worked full time and then I grew up with a stay at home mom. So it was just a different dynamic of seeing what was handled. Um, and it, it's just, uh, it's unlearning a lot for both sides, not just for me or or not just for my husband, for me also. So it's, uh, do you think your husband would either see himself as a recovering man child or like, would might get a little defensive, but know on the inside that there's probably some truth to that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I think, I think he, I think he's pretty open to anything. It depends on my tone. Cause sometimes I'm a little, I've, like I said, I've worked hard on it because I wasn't always the nicest about it. I, I used to be passive aggressive. I was like passive aggressive to a fault where I would just like tuck it back. And then one day I would just like, unleash hell (laughs) on him and then i learned that that is no way of being like Mm. hey you don't do this that's why like when i said i feel statements have been a game changer for us because it's just it's been a way for me to be like hey like this is how i'm feeling right now and this is on me like this is a me issue 
but this is what you're doing to create the me yeah. issue type of thing where it takes off a little bit of like the attack per se. But again, I think he just doesn't, I think it'd be eye opening for him because he, he just grew up in a dynamic that it was a little off. So it's a lot of learning on his half. And I, I wonder, would you mind if I shared just a little bit of my offerings with uh, what I do, the men that I do with, the work that I do Absolutely. with men. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if he might actually be a, a decent candidate because he's got you as like you're talking Me. about these things 24 <laughs> seven. Yeah. But um, so I work directly with men. I realized that giving advice to women was not not useful for society. There's there's plenty of mom creators that can listen to another mom, um, mm-hmm. but I I see myself as like a fifth grader teaching third graders. Um, I'm not a professor. I'm not the Gottman in- Institute. I went through this a little over a year ago. Um, yeah. And I think sometimes we need someone to hold it. And part of the reason I say recovering man child is I feel like being a man child is almost like a disease that's been passed down to us that we don't know how to get out of. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I haven't been a part of AA, but I understand that in AA, like you have a sponsor and you have someone kind of holding your hand along the way that has just gone through it too. Um, so yeah. in a lot of ways I see that sort of, I'm, I'm shepherding these guys through taking a hard look at themselves in the mirror. Fair play was not written for men. Uh, it was written to women. And so it's hard to read. Um, I had the, both the, the luck and the challenge of having 80,000 followers on TikTok, mostly women holding me accountable to being a better person back then. And so there was some comfort in taking that hard look and sharing with them after each chapter, like this is what I'm seeing in myself that I don't like about myself. Um, so a huge part of the programming they do it's uh men's men's mental load mastery. Uh, it's a 13 week course. We read through the fair play book. Our goal is to implement the fair play method. I have 98 reflection questions that we go through that I hold them accountable to every week. Um, and we have our boring meetings and I hold them to account for that. So it's, it's those having those meetings, like, let's talk about the minimum standard of care around the trash. Like, what does it look like to put out the trash? Does it mean six hours ahead of when the trash comes? Is it 12 hours? Is it the night before? If, if this literally happened the other day, if, uh, if the neighborhood, uh, app says like, Hey, there's a bear walking around, Mm -hmm. maybe don't put your trash out. Like, what do we do then? Is it Monday morning? Is that okay? Um, so, and like, I can pull it up as yesterday we had our boring meeting. Um, we talked about finances. We talked about, uh, what, uh, us surrendering our credit cards cause we're trying to work ourselves out of some debt. Um, Alyssa brought up, uh, we have a rental property that we are, that we had a leak last week that we need to double check in on cause we haven't heard anything. Um, and her mom, my mother-in-law sent over an Excel sheet for the whole family to fill out uh, for what we want for gifts and yeah. making sure that we get that done. So every, every boring meeting that we have, like we get like incrementally better and we think we, we hosted Thanksgiving for the first time and yeah. one, one boring meeting we walked all the way through the house. I made like a little vo- vlog reel on this one um, of like walking all the way through the house. This is what clean looks like for Thanksgiving so that I'm not coming to her that I know she has a higher standard of cleanliness. I'm not coming to her saying, okay, what's next. I can just look at the list that we create together and we're both very clear on what needs to happen and what level it needs to happen at. Yeah. Did you see that video on TikTok where the mom said I was away for however long and then she came into the house and the house is all destroyed? Yeah, I've been I've been stewing on how to respond to that one. I I haven't well, come up with a response yet. Yeah, it's hard because I well even so when I was gone in the beginning of November, I actually came home in the house because again I've had to have many conversations about it because I have had not the house ever coming. Oh my god, that's just that the video that I'm re- referencing. It's just like the house literally. Yeah. It looks was like trashed. Looks like the FBI came in searching for some drugs and just threw. Yeah, stuff it's everywhere. awful. Like it's it's bad. Um, but I, the house has never been like that when I've gotten home. But I've gotten home to like the shoveled mint, and this was years ago. And I remember having a conversation afterwards, being like, "Dude, come on!" And I remember sharing about it on. Um, that's actually one of the many reasons why a lot of women don't go away 
because mm-hmm. they don't want to come home to that. And then again, think about what that does. If you feel like you can never leave, like it's just awful. But um, I remember having a conversation being like, you know, I've had to lower my standards and just know that my clean, my clean isn't my husband's clean. And I don't know if I agree on that. And like, I would be curious on your thoughts. Like, do you think women have to lower their standards or do, where do you think that it's such a hard one? Cause I, I, yeah. unless you're like a major clean freak, like I think I'm sometimes a little above and beyond, but not really. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, it's a conversation that's going to be a little different for everybody, which is the, the yeah. easy answer to that one. But I think there are some things that are going to cause harm and there are some things that, I think if we look at where those standards come from and ask mm-hmm. ourselves, is that from the pride that we have in our home or is that fear of judgment for when someone comes over and they see a streak yeah. on our window? Um, yeah. And I think if we can identify if it's coming from fear of judgment versus like, like utility, um, then yeah. I think that can be the adjustment of um, standards. Cause like, you know, we looked at, for getting ready for Thanksgiving, she really wanted to have an accent wall, uh, for coming in. I was like, that's a big project to, to pick up four days before Thanksgiving. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Can we agree that if that's not done or like, if you don't get started on that by Saturday morning, that like, we don't do it. And, uh, we ended up decline, we ended up starting or she started like mid late Saturday. And I was like, uh, can we, can this wait till after? And, you know, we, I was glad we brought it up ahead of time. Um, yeah. and she ended up doing it and it looks great. I'm glad she did it. Um, and it definitely added, <laughs> she sounds like me. She it sounds added like a me lot of once stress she had it in her head. It's going to happen <laughs> for those like three or four days before. Cause I mean, she was still doing paint touch-ups like the night before yeah. Thanksgiving. Um, but like one of the things that we ended up compromising on was, polishing the wood of the chairs that people are sitting on. I yeah. still did the defuzzing of things because I saw the utility in that. I gave them a, like a quick rub down with a towel for dust, but not too concerned about people getting a polishing tiny them, bit of yeah. dust on them versus like getting animal hair on your butt. That's not fun. We have a big fluffy white dog that leaves yeah. hair everywhere. So I think looking at the utility of those things versus like was the polishing of the things fear of judgment for when, you know, my aunt comes over that has never been to our house and has a really, really clean home. Um, like, is that where some of that fear is coming from? So I think yeah. looking at like the, the weight of where that comes from, I think is a different answer to your question, but I think can help answer some of it. Yeah, no, I do like that one. Cause it is, it is like, a you have to look at like what your, norm is from (laughs) yeah because i definitely i definitely have that more or less i'm like your wife i literally sound that literally sounds like something i would do is before hosting anything being like let's paint this entire room and do that because that's how i operate and then it has to get done (laughs) usually it will get done like right that very second so uh yeah yeah before before my birthday party in august she really 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 wanted to have like our long like bose speaker underneath the tv like screwed into the wall instead of just sitting on the wood so that morning at like 6 a.m i was like trying to figure out how to drill into brick mortar and like (laughs) get this thing screwed in place i was like are we really doing this like this morning and she's Mm -hmm. like you wanted to have people over this how it's going to be and i think it it goes to show how much we've evolved even just in a couple months because we've get, gotten better at having like those boring meetings, like talking about minimum standards of care. And yeah, and but I think preventatively, I love that. Uh, it's the best part is when you're in the boring meeting and you see a landmine that you just picked up and you're like, we would have totally stepped on this Thanksgiving morning. Um, yeah. The one that we realized we had was, so I, I manage a hundred percent of dishes um, in our house I'm responsible for them 24 um, seven. The expectations they get emptied somewhere between like 6 AM and noon. And then, you know, yeah. they get filled and, and ran before the end of the night. And uh, when Alyssa was away for six days, two weeks ago, um, I noticed I didn't even have to run the dishwasher uh, between the two days because of how many, how few dishes I used between me yeah. and our toddler. And so I brought up to her, I was like, Hey, you know, you're going to be doing a ton of cooking. You're probably going to be using a lot of dishes. Like 
any chance we could like try to cut back on the amount that we're using um, because I'm anticipating this is going to be like a living sink uh, that like there's not going to be a whole lot of opportunity to run the dishwasher. So like if there's something in there, I'm just going to clean it. Um, and in that moment, as I brought that, she's like, wow, I'm just like really triggered right now. And because <laughs> we're in that like calm spot of like, yeah. let's talk about this now. Um, we were able to identify like some of the trigger of that. Uh, yeah. And then we not only did we deal with it, I was like, okay, I'm not going to bring up anything about extra dishes on Thanksgiving. I know that yeah. I'm just going to yeah. suck it up and, you know, deal with it if there's extra. <laughs> and yeah. I think she probably, I think she cut it back a little bit on the amount of dishes she might've used, like more likely to wipe the breadcrumbs off instead of just grabbing another plate. Yeah. Um, it's a big thing. I think, I think that's a big thing too, is like, I, I think that makes a good point is when you have these conversations, again, it may not be like an overnight thing, but I think just planting the seed in someone's head because a lot of it, again, it's not just a quick fix. A lot of this is like a psychological training. Like it's been ingrained in us. So for us to break certain habits or, you know, especially from the guy side of like doing certain things, a lot of this has just been so reinforced in us and how we view ourselves and how we view our contributions and, and what that means to us in a relationship. There's so many layers of it that it's just like, it takes a second to kind of like step back and like rehat, like refigure, figure out what that means to you and then try and implement it. And then it may like take a few times, I think to like kind of implement and yeah. implement change. It's change. It's, it's huge change. It takes multiple attempts to really incorporate yeah. something. And in. I want to, I want to present one other really good reason for the value of this is in a lot of the calls and conversations I have with guys, they have that moment. Oh yeah. Like, hon, I'll do better. Like I'll do the dishes more often. And then, you know, there's a typical one great week of them doing dishes. And then, you know, two weeks later, they're kind of back to status quo. <clears throat> the scary part, I think for a lot of women, when they have that initial conversation is like, Oh, things are going to, Oh, they're not going to change. I don't want to even get my hopes up here. Yeah. And the value of having those recurring conversations is you know that you'll have an, an iterative opportunity to bring it back up. And yeah. so I think the heaviness that Alyssa used to impose on these conversations, like she would get really heated and we reflected multiple times later. So like, I need to raise my voice so that you'll understand so that you'll actually implement change. And I think, that was because we weren't having consistent conversations. So she needed to really hit home once so that yeah. change would happen. But if we're have, and there were really emotional conversations, but I think when we've gotten better at having way more frequent ones, she doesn't feel the need to get like as almost purposefully exaggerated about an issue. Um, yeah. Because she knows that we'll get to reflect on it a week later. Well, because it's awkward. It is awkward. Yeah. It's awkward at first. It really is because it's, it is deep. It is. It's always going to be deep. I think even just, you know, it was even awkward. My husband and I just, like I said, we just went on our first trip the last week. We were in London by ourselves. It was like our first kid-free trip in over four years and wow. doing that. Like I was even nervous before even going. Cause I was like, this is so weird. Like we haven't been outside of being mom and dad, but like when you get such in a rhythm of your, whether it's your life or your roles and you try to change anything it's weird it's like very awkward at first and it's going to feel forced and it's going to feel strange and you you know especially for you know women's side is kind of we've been i, I think for women we kind of get hesitant because we've been taught that we should be appreciative of everything especially if they're out working if they earn the paycheck that we should be appreciative of everything i think that's a a, a role that we have that we have to break down it's just again there's just we could talk about this all day because it literally is such a multifaceted. <laughs> You're fun to talk to, Mary. I gotta say, they, there's some of some of the podcasts I've been on. I, they ask me a lot of questions, and I I feel great because I feel very expert in the way that they're sort of creating me over there. But yeah. it's been a lot more conversational, and I I, I appreciate the level of. Um, almost humility I've had to had. And like, I, I appreciate that you're not seeing me as an expert, but like another parent that's in this fight for, yeah. for change. That's all. Yeah. That's all I've ever aimed for any of this stuff is cause 
I'm like the least expert expert. And that's everyone I've usually brought on. Even if I bring on an expert, I'm always telling them, I'm like, I don't plan out questions. I'm like, I don't do that. Like they'll email, I, I only did for recently at Cat and Nat on because they're just like big ones. I was like, I want to feel official. <laughs> but I was like, I ordinarily don't do any of that because I just I want to come on and talk to you as a person and as a dad and as someone that is like trying to figure this all out. Because let's be honest, even if you have an, an expertise, you still no one knows what the hell they're doing ever. So, yeah. you know, that's my game here. But anyway, for everyone listening, I'll wrap this up because Zach, it, we've been talking for a while. So this has been good. But I'll uh, I'll link everything of Zach's in the show notes. Please go check him out. Just check him out. Play his videos when your husband's around. Um, if you're dealing with any of this stuff, go check out your his courses. Have your husband check out the courses. Have those conversations. Have those, have those more be, board meetings. Like have everything that you can it's 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 a good thing like it's all good things none of these are like it's hard conversations but they're not negative these aren't for negative changes in your life these are all really positive changes that can come out of it but it takes time i'm even in it i'm still in it like, mm. it's not perfect over here we it takes a lot so and by the way there's not really a great way to check out my courses necessarily but if people are interested they can book uh like a relationship goals consult where i'll talk to them about like what your goals are and see if, oh, cool. see if what my, what I offer kind of fits that. Cool. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks Zach. Thanks Mary. Another episode down. Thank you all so much for listening. If you love today's episode, I would be so appreciative if you would leave a rating and review. I cannot begin to tell you how much those mean to me, but also how much they help me get in front of more eyes and more ears. As always, be sure to check back every Tuesday and Friday for a new episode, whether it's an episode with me, me and my husband, me and Katie, or just another incredible, amazing guest. Stay tuned for more honest, real, raw chit chat. And hey, do me a favor before you go. Remind yourself how amazing you are, how enough you are, how special you are. And boy, oh boy, I sure am glad to have you here. Thanks, friend. <laughs>